Hello, I'm Sam Visner. I'm the director of the National Cybersecurity Federally Funded Research and Development Center, which is operated by the MITRE Corporation. And I'm thrilled and honored today to be joined by Secretary Michael Chertoff of the Chertoff Group. Uh, as you may know, Secretary Chertoff was Secretary of the United States Department of Homeland Security from 2005 to 2009. So it's a delight to be able to, uh, to uh, work with you today, Secretary Chertoff. Good. What we want to do today is talk about election security. And uh, I think it's important to do a little bit of level setting. There is a lot of material floating out there, information and perhaps not very good information about election security. And I think it's our duty to be clear about these issues right from the start. At a recent election security event, someone asked how it was possible for the Russians to hack into voting machines to change vote tallies in 2016. And I can hardly believe it. Could you help level set what really happened in the 2016 election, Secretary Chertoff? Yeah, I think there are three separate things. Um, I'm not aware of actual votes being changed or hacking into voting machines, which I think, to be honest, would be quite difficult, certainly at scale. Um, I think there were three things that did happen. There was certainly um, malware attributed to the Russians found in some of the voter databases in some of the states. It's not clear that anything was changed, but it looks like it might have been reconnaissance. There was also disinformation, information being put out to create volatility or antagonism in order to kind of drive people's thought process about the election. That's not, strictly speaking, hacking. It's more manipulation of the information domain. And then there was hacking into the Democratic National Committee a database and the release of some documents through what we call doxing on Wikipedia, which again was designed to inflame uh, people's anger and a sense of, of disunion, but wasn't actually hacking into the mechanics of the infrastructure itself. I understand. Well, this kind of tampering, though, is problematic. I think a number of people are concerned about the integrity of election data. And if there's any question about the integrity of it, about whether or not it's accurate, whether or not it's been tampered with, that can undermine confidence in the election process. That's been an area on which we focused is, and, and one of the concerns I've had is an attack on essentially confidentiality, integrity, and availability. The possibility, for example, that ransomware could be used against a, com a component of this. But from your perspective, why do you think data integrity is really so crucial to the elections process? I think that if there were a serious attack on a database or information about who's registered to vote, that might essentially disqualify or impede the ability of people to actually cast their vote. And if that was strategically targeted at particular locations, it might actually have an effect on the election because nowadays with modern data collection and data analytics, it's pretty clear what areas tend to go blue and what tend to go red. Even if there was a question that would raise issues about legitimacy and whether there was rigging of the election. So preserving the integrity of the registration system is a critical part of the whole electoral process. Thank you. By the way, we're working in MITRE on this issue in particular. We've developed a set of recommendations and a reference architecture to be able to improve the cybersecurity of voter registration database systems exactly for the reason you outlined, to make sure that people have confidence that the votes that, that, that are being counted represent the people who should be voting where they should be voting in the election in which they, they should be voting. Secretary Chertoff, I'd like to move on to a second topic uh, within the question of election integrity, and that is recovery and resilience. One of the things we talk about in our voter registration systems is recovery, is the ability, if, if there is a cybersecurity problem to be able to sustain operations and to recover such that confidence is not impaired. Local governments across the United States have been hit with ransomware. We've seen that in a number of metropolitan areas. And if that should for some reason extend to voter registration systems, we need the ability to recover quickly and to continue operations such that 
such that confidence in the process is not, in fact, damaged. Resiliency is so important, particularly with elections. And if we look at what happened, you know, in, for example, during the Iowa caucuses recently, even if the app hadn't worked, tallying in the general operations should still have worked. What what are some of the important resiliency con concepts or activities that, in your view, state and local election officials should be undertaking now? Well, for one is backing up the data. I mean, the essence of ransomware is that you, you the, the adversary locks down your data and makes it inaccessible. That means you want to be frequently backing up the data on a separate disconnected database so that if all of a sudden you don't have access to your primary database or you don't have confidence in it, you can go to your backup database. Second thing you need is you need the ability then to communicate that data to the people in the field who are actually dealing with the voters so they can verify the voter registration. And again, that may mean an alternative pathway or method of communication, uh, and preferably one out of band, not using the same emails or the same um, linkages. And finally, you need a plan. People need to understand what would happen if on the day of the election, there were a major lockdown. So you've got to take people through it. They've got to understand roles and responsibilities, and they've got to even exercise a little bit what they would do. Thank you. And I couldn't agree more. In fact, I, I want to make people aware that there is some guidance that's been published. It's in the public domain by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and it provides detailed information on how to detect, how to respond, and how to recover from uh, ransomware. And people listening to this podcast can Google NIST, N-I-S-T, Data Integrity, and they can find uh, this, this guidance. I'd like to move on to sort of the last topic for the day, and that's the question of disinformation and deep fakes. We're seeing that with elections and election security. We're seeing that as well, by the way, in the context of the current COVID-19 I saw some, some recent news from McAfee about state domains and voter information sites being potential targets for attacks and for deliberate disinformation and deep fakes. And essentially, what we're learning is that malicious actors can set up fake websites and harm the integrity of our elections by distributing false information. Everything from relative something small like hey, this election site will be closed, but people can move to another one which doesn't exist and people therefore don't get to vote, to information about candidates that is patently false but is crafted to look true. The advice to combat this is fairly simple. You know, ensure you're using a .gov website domain. But this leads me to thinking about what the future of election security looks like. I know you're doing work in this area. How will advances in technology change, Secretary Chertoff, the nature of election security work? And are we ready for it, particularly in this area of disinformation and deep fakes? This is very challenging because, first of all, disinformation covers a broad range of things. I mean, in some ways, the easiest uh, thing to address is the question of somebody spoofing a website and putting f false information up on what is an official website. And there are ways you can, you know, secure the domain so that doesn't happen. What's harder is when social media is manipulated to generate false messages or to affect the way people think about the election. Uh, there are algorithms that are, are being developed to try to determine when you have a concerted effort to manipulate social media in order to drive certain messages. But to be honest, it's a, a, a kind of a... a a tennis match. The bad guys come up with new techniques. Um, and there are also serious First Amendment issues about the ability of the government, for example, to intervene to suppress what are false messages. Many, in many ways now what we're seeing is the adversary simply exploit divisions within our own society. We're seeing that now with the coronavirus, where you have a segment of society that doesn't believe in medicine, doesn't believe in vaccine, and they're either saying that this is all a conspiracy or they're suggesting preposterous remedies, which can be fatal. If you actually think about the deep fakes issue, that's kind of a subset. And that has to do with it's kind of a super version of photoshopping where someone would create a fictitious audio and video that looks genuine and try to make it seem, for example, that a candidate was saying and doing something really outrageous and awful. We're trying now to work with technology companies to see if there's a way to determine 
that that is a false deep fake upload. And either you can do it by watermarking real photographs and real audio so that in the absence of a watermark, you know something is phony, or there may be algorithms and, and machine learning that allow you to detect imperfections in the deep fake and expose it. But here again, it's going to be a back and forth because every time we discover a flaw in the deep fakes, the architects of the deep fakes correct the flaw. Well, this has been a real problem. People at Miter have been working on an application called Squint that allows users, for example, in state or local governments or election officials, or now people working on COVID-19, to do a screenshot, a screen capture of suspected false information and send it to an analytic engine which looks at possible attribution and heuristics and gives you a sense of whether or not it's, it's probably false or probably true. But certainly, as adversaries become more skillful, this is going to become a, a larger problem. Secretary Chertoff, you've been very, very generous with your time, and it's been, uh, as always, a pleasure to speak with you, and it's certainly an honor to do so. Do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to share with us? Well, I think that what we're seeing with the coronavirus, in some ways, is a dry run for some of the issues we would face in the election. And in fact, it's quite possible that as of the date of the election on November 3rd, if, if the virus returns, as many believe it will, there may be an effort to combine the two in a disinformation campaign in order to discourage certain kinds of people from voting. So what I think this teaches us is we need to look at the media and social media platforms with a certain degree of skepticism. We also need to educate people as to how to use critical thinking to validate or refute what are efforts to manipulate us. And then, of course, at the end of the day, the infrastructure is critical. We, we are now moving more and more to online work. That, I think, will, even when the virus is gone because of vaccinations, I think that will continue to be the case to some degree for a whole lot of reasons. And therefore, we need to make sure the infrastructure on which we are operating our networks can deal with the additional traffic and the additional stress. And to be honest, I'm seeing now with some of what we're doing online that there is a lot of strain on the system. So I think that's going to be a major issue to focus on. Thank you. Well, I think that's absolutely right. We've been thinking, I was in a discussion earlier today about what will it take to operate in a new normal in which as business comes back online, and we try to resume more of our normal economic activities. We do so, however, with continued social distancing and operating at a distance, and how much more dependent we're going to be on our online resources for administering elections, for going after COVID-19, and for our routine business, and how much uh, additional vulnerability we may have to deal with, and how much more vigilant and responsible enterprises will have to be, as well as individuals. Let me close by reminding people that if you're a state and local officials who want to find out more about the Chertoff Group, please visit chertoffgroup.com. If someone is interested in the work that MITRE is doing about voter registration security, please Google or use your favorite search engine and look for MITRE Voter Registration, M-I-T-R-E Voter Registration, to find our guide. Secretary Chertoff, again, I want to thank you. You've been very generous with your time. These are powerful and useful insights. I urge people at the state and local level and those who are charged with the security of our critical enterprises to pay close attention to this conversation, particularly to Secretary Chertoff's words. And with that, thank you very much. And everybody stay safe. Thank you. And stay safe, particularly for those, our first responders and those, and those on whom we depend. Thank you. Yeah.